Hello again. So in this lecture, we will uh, look at a few different things. We've looked at the central dogma. Now we'll look at um, a few aspects of microscopy. And then we will look at structures of bacterial cells and how they are shaped overall. Um, so let's get into microscopy. Let's see what we're going to see. So the basic idea is that microorganisms are very small. If you look on this graph at the y-axis, you'll see each line goes down by a factor of 10. Um, humans are roughly 1 to 2 meters tall. Um, frog eggs are 1 1,000th one of that. Most bacteria are 1 1,000th one of a frog egg, so they're a million times smaller than us, roughly. So, um, as they are much, much smaller than us, and often we can't see them without um, artificial magnification, we might need new ways of thinking about them. And I want you to learn these units. I want you to learn what a millimeter is and how you write millimeter. This is exactly how you write it. Lowercase m, lowercase m for millimeter. That's one one thousandth of a meter. And if we go back, around a millimeter is about a the size of a frog egg. You can you can see something a millimeter across easily. Um, something you could not see with your eyes um, is a micrometer. And you write micrometer with this lowercase Greek mu symbol. It's this u with an extra little tail, and then m. So mu is micro, micro, and m is meter, micrometer. That's one one millionth of a meter. And if we go back here, we see one micrometer is around the size of bacteria. Most of them are on the scale of a micrometer to three or four micrometers. Um, and this might not be the kind of y-axis you're used to seeing where every tick mark goes up by a factor of 10, but we'll look at those again in unit two because we need these for microbiology. So again, humans are around a meter tall, very roughly speaking. That's like three feet roughly. One one thousandth of that is one millimeter. One one thousandth of a millimeter is a micrometer, and that's about the size of bacteria. That's what we are going to think about most often. That's going to be our most important unit. And then one one thousandth of a millimeter is one nanometer. That's one billionth of a meter. And that's on the scale of molecules. Um, small, yeah, small molecules might be around a nanometer in size. Um, so what I want you to do again is to pronounce these out loud. Just say what they are. 10 meters, 10 micrometers. So what's this? And what's this? And what's this? Say them out loud and memorize what they are. That a, a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter and a nanometer is a billionth of a meter and be able to write them. So if I write micrometer, you should be able to write mu, little m. And if I write nanometer, you should be able to write n, little n, little m. The reason for that is you're going to see these written out, and it's very helpful if you can visualize a little bit about what that means. And you can know, for example, a micrometer is much smaller than a millimeter. Okay, and we'll, we'll get back into math um, in lecture two. But for now, we want to look at the microscopes that let us see these tiny little things. And the first one is um, the one we use in the lab, compound light microscopes. That means they have multiple lenses. They have two lenses. They have an objective lens and an ocular lens. The objective lens sticks down and gets close to the slide, and the ocular lens is what we look through. Both of those magnify the image a little bit to different degrees. If you had a, a non-compound microscope, that would be a single lens, so that would be a magnifying glass. So um, 
this is what we'll use in lab. This is really what I want you to think about. So what I've been talking about is magnification, and magnification is the act of making an image bigger. And that's obviously what we need to do. We need to make a invisibly small bacterial cell big enough to see it. It turns out magnification is easy to achieve optically. You can just stack lenses and magnify something a whole lot. Uh, you could take a picture with a great digital camera and just blow it up a lot, and that's another way of magnifying something. If you've ever done that, you realize, though, that you eventually reach a limit where um, you're just blowing up big pixels and there's no more detail you can get. And what that's getting at is resolution or resolving power. And so resolution or resolving power is the ability to see that two separate objects are actually separate. Let's think about resolution. Typically, when people talk about resolution or resolving power, they're talking about the ability to tell that two objects are separate. So the two objects we're looking at here are two little dots, and we have adequate resolution to tell that they are separate. If we had resolution that wasn't quite as good, what we would see instead would be kind of two gray blurs and they'd be bigger and they'd be closer together still we can we can tell that they're separate but if we make the resolution even worse what we would see is something like this just a blob and so right so we have to think about how good is our resolution? How good is our resolving power? Can we see the difference between, um, can we see that two small objects are separate? And realistically, that, that's not what we're looking at um, in the lab. We're not looking at little dots. We're trying to see details in bacterial cells or in fungal cells. And if our resolution is not very good, we'll still be able to see that two cells are separate from each other, but we won't be able to see any detail. And that really is um, what we get with light. So the visible light can only give us a certain amount of resolving power. And you, it doesn't matter how well you build your microscope or how much it magnifies, you'll never see more detail in a bacterial cell than this. So this um, is a picture of four bacterial cells. You can see no detail. There's nothing we can see in them um, beyond their basic shape. And even their basic shape is fuzzy. Where does this cell start and end? You can't really pinpoint it because it's a little bit blurred. And that's because the resolution of this, of this image really is not so far different from the size of one of these cells. So that's something we're going to see. Um, so one thing I want to show you is um, from astronomy, where this is much more like easy to see. And I want to show you the difference between um, two different space telescopes. The Spitzer Space Telescope was, maybe is, I don't know, about uh, one meter across. It has a something like a one meter mirror and it takes infrared pictures of the sky and it has similar magnification to the James Webb Space Telescope. But it turns out for telescopes the resolving power is determined completely by how big the scope is, by how big that mirror is. The bigger that mirror is the better resolving power you can get and that's just an optical limit. There is no getting around it. There's no way to get better resolution without making a bigger mirror. So that's what they did. They made web, which is huge. And that this this just blows me away to see the difference between these two. But so here you see Spitzer and that's what you get with a much bigger telescope. It's the same magnification but much 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 better resolving power. So for example 
these three dots here. I don't know if they're stars or galaxies. How would I know? I don't know what they are. Over here, they're a blob. You can't tell that they're separate from each other because their re resolution is too too big, too coarse, too bad to show us that detail. Um, and it also means lots of these little faint things just disappear completely into the noise. Um, and that's really what we what we're dealing with when we when we look at bacteria under the microscope. We are stuck with the optical wavelengths of light, giving us a limit to our resolving power. Um, if you have access to an electron microscope, there you're limited by the wavelength of electrons, which is much, much smaller, and so you get much better resolution and you can actually see details. But there you have to prepare samples in a very particular way. That brings us to contrast. Contrast is what lets you see the difference between the cell and the background, or between two different things in a cell. And most of the time, um, what we are going to see in our class is stains. And if you've ever, and that's what gives the cells their color, because most cells don't have any color. There's nothing to see. They are clear. They are colorless. So you have to stain them with some pigment that makes them visible. And if you've ever done histology and looked at tissue samples, they have been stained, usually to make the nuclei blue and the proteins red or something like that. Well, if you didn't stain them first, it would all be kind of grayish um, and very hard to see it. And you couldn't see the nuclei at all. So contrast is something we have to think about. If you ever use an electron microscope, you'll see you have to embed your samples in metal, or maybe you have to remove all the water and coat them with metal. Um, that changes the shape of the cells. So electron microscopes are great. Um, they give you pictures like this. This one is a scanning electron microscope. It shows you the surface features, but you can't trust them because this cell to take this picture, they had to remove all the water from it by soaking it in different solutions. Um, then they had to put it under a strong vacuum and coat the outside of it with a thin layer of metal. Um, and that definitely changes the surface structures. So who knows what these little hair things should look like? We don't know. But again, that's what you have to do to get enough contrast to see anything. You have to do something to give the cells contrast. And for this kind of electron microscopy, that means you have to coat them with metal. What we do in our lab is use prepared slides or stain slides. So um, one of the things, one of the tasks you're going to have in this class is learning the parts of a microscope. So here is a list of microscope parts and their functions. So what they do. This is going to be a little easier for you to learn than some of the other things because you're going to use these in the lab. Um, but I urge you to learn this uh, terminology. Um, and go to the, uh, the study guide to see how much detail. I think it will tell you exactly what you need to know about these things. And here is a handy diagram. There's also one in your uh, lab manual. So what else? Um, oh, how do we how do we calculate the magnification of one of these microscopes? Well, you multiply the magnification generated by the objective lens by the magnification generated by the ocular lens. Multiply those to get the total magnification. And again, two lenses, you could add a third lens to get even more magnification, but you wouldn't get any more detail because we're already at the limit of our resolving power. And um, cool, cool, that is, well, that's, that's all I really have in these um, slides for microscopy. I just want to point out one other thing. What are we looking at here? Why, um, why are they dark against the light background? This is actually a picture taken from a microscope that generates its own contrast. It uses um, the difference in refraction between the water and the cells. 
So light is refracted a little bit differently through the cells and it blocks light that has come through cells and it makes cells dark against a light background. So that's another trick to give contrast. And um, in the lab, we have a few microscopes that can do that, but mostly we're going to use stains to generate contrast. Okay, cool. I'll see you at the next video.